Hi, my name is Jamie Woods. I am the instructor for uh, EC314, Public and Private Investment Analysis. This is the online class you're taking during the winter of 2015 at Portland State University. Uh, this is intended to take the place of the usual first day events where we walk through the syllabus and discuss some of the um, questions you may have and the way the class is supposed to work. Um, but it's an online course, so a uh, quick video seems to be the right way of doing it. Um, the first paragraph that we have in the introduction is intended to be a duplication of the description you're going to see in the bulletin, and it is technically correct. We're going to be looking at investments, which are things which provide benefits over time. Um, but the second paragraph is really what I'm aiming for. Um, I want to make sure that every engineer who takes this, who has to take the FE and PE exams, pass that really small fraction of them that has to do with engineering economics. Uh, for most of the engineers in Oregon, um, this is a requirement. It's not true for computer engineering, but everyone else has to take a class like this. It's there by law. I come from a, a long background of consulting in energy efficiency and program evaluation. And so my background has been working on teams that include engineers, economists, MBA types, as well as some other folks like sociologists, folklorists, uh, and a bunch of other people. Um, but this class is put together in order to look at all those skills that we're all expected to have in this particular field. So this is an assemblage of the things that I know that uh, engineers, economists, and the business types um, uh, have to share. It's part of our shared language. Uh, a lot of the examples you see in the class are based upon mistakes that I made, uh, things that I learned, uh, but they're also there to make it so that if I bump into you in a project later on in life, I won't want to strangle you, which is kind of my intent. I want to make sure that you've got the skills so you don't frustrate me and anyone around you. Um, overall, this uh, will tend to be a um, fairly useful course. I have students that come back to me years later saying that they still refer to some of the material on their job or that they're pretty happy that they now finally understand how their mortgage works uh, or that, yes, they did make an income and cash flow statement and decided that that great business idea that they had was really a bomb and they shouldn't do it. Um, so I'm trying to convey a bunch of these skills in a course. Uh, this is an online course, which means you better have an Internet connection or it's not going to work. Um, it's also useful uh, to have a webcam. Um, it's kind of difficult to uh, type a bunch of questions. Webcams make it easier because we can do things like um, share spreadsheets between us, uh, diagrams. I got a whiteboard that's usually behind me, uh, and so we can work on some diagrams and things like that. Um, just because it's an online course doesn't mean that we're not going to see each other's faces. Um, it just means that you're not necessarily um, going to be in my office and we're not going to be in a classroom. Final thing that's a little bit curious about this course is that there is a required in-person final exam. That final exam will be 8 a.m. on March 20th, and so this is the last day of the final exam period. Uh, we don't have a room yet. It will be someplace on the campus. Uh, the final exam is required to pass the class. You can't skip the final exam. Uh, if you can't make it to campus at that time to take the final exam, please drop the course before the January 11th uh, drop date, which allows you to get 100% of your funds back. Uh, in addition, uh, when you do show up for the final exam, please bring a picture ID, preferably your student ID, so we can check and see that you're the right person. My goal here is to reduce the incidence of cheating on online exams. The face-to-face, uh, -face, in-person final exam is just one of the ways that I can check on that. Moving down to prerequisites, because this is a um, university studies course, it's a U course, um, I'm not allowed to have the usual prerequisites that you see on a course like this at other institutions. Uh, at other institutions, this course is um, simply an engineering economics course. I can crank up the math requirements and we can do some rather interesting things. However, because this is part of university studies, I'm not allowed to have any prerequisites beyond those required to get into college. 
And we also include some material that is commonly in other courses in order to make sure that it has general interest and can receive a U designation. Uh, when we take a look at the M, uh, outline, you'll see that there's a, a chunk there that's usually in a personal finance course. And um, that's part of what makes it so that we can fit it into a U designation. Moving on to uh, contact information, how you get a hold of us. Uh, this class is starting off with, I think, either 155 or 200 people. I'm not exactly sure that's there. Um, it's an awful lot of people and stack on that another course that I teach too. The idea is that if you guys email me questions, it's just not gonna work. It's gonna completely overwhelm my, uh, my inbox. The other thing is, is that if one person asks a question, it's pretty common that you know lots of people are gonna have the same question, they just haven't done it yet. So when I get emails, I'll tend to get five or six of them. They're just about the same. Do me a favor, rather than emailing, I've set up a forum system for you. Um, it's called Piazza. There's a link right there that you see it. There's also a link in D2L. And uh, go ahead and use that for primary communication as long as it's not anything that's way too personal. Um, and this is to make it so that I can check it a couple of times a day. I can deal with some of the common questions. And over time, you'll get used to the idea of searching there first rather than trying to send me an email or, or something along those lines. Um, I have a uh, folder for each of the modules that are there, so there shouldn't be any confusion about topics. And in fact, Piazza enforces you to um, choose one of the modules that's there. Um, and there's even ones for kind of general questions like logistics and other. Uh, I'll kind of keep Piazza. Uh, Piazza. It's uh, lucky enough to have uh, an iOS and Android app so I can check it basically on my phone. You can go ahead and ask questions on your phone that are there. Um, and I'm expected to a certain extent for you guys to answer each other's questions too, if they're things that are you know pretty good. I'll check and I'll flag them as being good answers when they in fact are good answers and I'll make clarifications there. Um, it turns out if you ask me a question in email that should be on Piazza, I'll kind of give you this um, it's a form email back that says, hey, you should probably ask this in the forum and you know, it, it, it'll be a little bit better. Um, so just start with the forums and then move over to some of the other uh, systems if you've got one of these kind of general questions. Uh, I've chosen Piazza rather than the D2L forums in order to make it so that we have a communication channel which is independent of the school. Uh, I've been uh, hurt by uh, too many, you know, D2L uh, apocalypses and uh, problems with the login server that I wanted to have something which was independent. I've yet to see Piazza down on anything. Um, it was also chosen because we do a little bit of math in the course and so the form allows you to do uh, LaTeX markup, uh, which means that the equations will look nicer in there if you choose to do so. Um, the uh, forms in D2L are more geared towards the humanity side rather than people that have to do with math. Um, there's a TA assigned to the course. His name is uh, Peter Holzman. Um, Peter's a master student in economics and uh, he will be assisting with uh, answering some of your questions on Piazza as well as uh, grading some of the questions that are in D2L. I'm the person who's writing all the questions, uh, so you will see some uh, a lot of commonalities and quirks, and they're usually mine rather than Peter's. We don't know exactly when Peter off, Peter's office hours are gonna be, but if you wanna visit him in person, go ahead and check out his place over at Kramer Hall 230, which is right next to the elevator. You should be able to also get him with uh, either through email or the IM function on your uh, pdx.edu account. My office is in Kramer Hall 241O. Uh, best way of contacting me is probably Instant Messenger. Um, so hit that thing first. If you're not an Instant Messenger kind of person, uh, texting and phone also works too. I'm trying to minimize the use of email, which is the next one on the list, um, mostly because I'm incredibly terse when I answer emails and people interpret terse as being angry. Um, and it's not. It also turns out that a lot of times you have questions where I need to ask a couple of questions of you before I can figure out what's going on because there's some kind of weird misunderstanding or assumption I can't get a hold of. Um, the IM function allows me to do this a little bit more conversationally. 
uh, and makes it so that you know you're more likely to come to an understanding of what's going on, uh, and it's also a little bit faster too. I am, uh, however, an early bird, so I get up really early in the morning and I go to bed fairly early too. And that means if you're working like you know, after nine o'clock at night, you're not going to get an answer from me if you IM me. Um, you also may not get an answer from me on the weekend. I had a student last term who almost invariably managed to text me just as I was heading up for a hike in the gorge or something along those lines. It was the weirdest thing you'd ever seen. So please be aware there may be some lags when I don't respond right away. Uh, it's just because there's a, a bunch of other things going on there, but stay away from the evening hours and the weekends and we should be a-okay. Uh, my in-person office hours are Wednesday noon to one, and that's the last week class. Doesn't include final exam week. Uh, you don't need to make an appointment to come to those hours. These kind of just show up. They're drop-in things. They're also rigged so that you can attend online via webcam. So when we get to D2L, there'll be a link there. It'll bring up the um, uh, Hangout app that we have on our pdx.edu accounts, and will be in my office, the webcam will be on, you'll probably get a really boring static shock, uh, shot of a whiteboard or me or something along those lines. And you can join office hours that way if you're not gonna be on campus or don't necessarily wanna see me face to face. Uh, there will also be a bunch of appointments uh, that are available for you for one-on-one -on -one meetings. Because this is an online course, it's assumed that all the appointments that you make will be online. And so this is the situation where having a webcam that works is definitely effective. Um, the uh, office, uh, those appointment settings, at a minimum, there should be, and I'm kind of checking right now, uh, appointment slots on Monday afternoon and Monday and Tuesday evenings. Uh, the evening appointments are running from about 6.30 to 8. There are first come, first serve and that will um, uh, make it so that we can actually talk over problems that we have in class that you're having. Next, moving on to the textbook. Uh, the official textbook there is uh, Parks Contemporary Engineering Economics, fourth edition. The fifth edition is out. I have an all fired rage up on textbook uh, costs. And my goal is to make it to it so it's as le least expensive for you as possible. In this kind of situation, what I say is I have examined almost all of the engineering economics textbooks that are out there on the market. And almost all of them are just about the same. There is a little variation in material, um, but it's nothing as particularly significant. What I suggest that you do, if you want the easy answer, just go ahead and jump online, catch one of these uh, you know, fourth edition books. You can get them relatively inexpensive, um, usually less than 30 bucks. Uh, or what you can do is just go to the library, take a look at the shelf that has all of these books down there, and pick the one that works for you. Uh, I'm one of those guys that likes uh, a thin, terse book with you know lots of equations, you know, no big color photos or anything like that. I like, you know, little skinny dense books. Uh, some people don't like them that way. So pick a book that works for you. Uh, you can pick just about anything that has engineering economics in the title that'll work. Uh, if you're get, not getting the fourth edition, I've posted up the table of contents to the fourth edition right there. And so when we're working on, you know, a topic which is like time value of money, um, you can go ahead and find where that is in your book. And that kind of thing is your responsibility if you want to do something other than the fourth edition. So just to be clear, just about any book that says engineering economics works, pick the one that works for you. There is a supplemental book that's down here, um, which is Shom's Outline of Engineering Economics, which some people have found very useful once we hit time value of money. It has lots of worked examples in it. Um, they're usually about 10 bucks. Uh, again, my goal here is to make it so that you have access to all the material that you need and it as, is as uh, least expensive as possible. Now, there's also a bunch of other online resources. Um, there is uh, D2L, which you guys are assumed to know about by this point. Uh, the wiki for the course, which is very extensive and has 
a huge number of videos and uh, other resources on it, as well as Piazza, which is what we're using for the forums. Um, D12 is the main thing that we're going to be coping with for your homework, the online quizzes. If you have technical problems, do not ask me about them. You're actually being charged extra money for um, kind of enhanced service because you are on an online course. So go ahead and use it. Uh, you can either um, contact them through um, PSU Online, PDX EDU. Um, they have phone numbers there. They have instant messengers there if you have any kind of problem whatsoever. Uh, if you need a tutorial on how to use DTOL, there's usually one on your landing page when you first start off. Uh, so before you start the course, hit that so you know how to use D2L. Once we get to D2L, and there'll be a, a separate video on what's going on there, uh, you'll have some important links. There'll be uh, a link to the wiki, which is where we're going to have all that supplementary material. Uh, in fact, a, a lot of students say that um, the wiki is much more useful than the book. There'll be a link there so you can schedule those one-on-one -on -one appointments. Um, and that's just a, a quick little um, uh, Google um, calendar appointments thing, uh, which the educational accounts have. Um, there'll be a calendar of your deadlines, which is when all quizzes are due. And then you'll have that table of contents for the fourth edition book. Once you get onto D2L, there'll be uh, a tab there for course content and there'll be a, a bunch of modules. And so there'll be a module for time value of money, there'll be a module for internal rate of return, and so on down the line. They're generally arranged so that there are four major elements that are in there. Um, the first element and where you should start is the preparation. And so there'll be a section there on, here's what parts of the book to read. There will also be links to the pages on the wiki that you should go ahead and review before you start any of the quizzes. Um, the videos and podcasts that are in the wiki are required. Don't skip those. Listen to all of those. Uh, watch all of those. I generally try to keep them relatively short. Um, so I try to keep them in the 10-minute the range. A couple will be over into 15 minutes. Uh, probably the syllabus video will be the longest one that you'll have. Uh, so you know, keep that in mind. It, it's meant to be fairly one topic, one video kind of thing to make it easy to go through. Uh, once you're done with those, there are a series of uh, practice questions uh, in a quiz there. These are actually used to be graded questions. After I'm done using them in a graded fashion, they cycle down to the practice section. Um, so they are representative of the questions that I write. Uh, the online course has some uh, longer answers in the post assignments that you won't see examples of in the practice section. Um, but you will see examples when you see them in the wiki. Um, so it'll be the, the right kind of questions that are there. You will also see on there two pre-quizzes. Uh, these are identical except for some very minor changes. Um, the due dates on these two things are separated by 24 hours. The intent is to make it so that you've, you can take uh, one swing at the pre-quiz. And what you'll see afterwards is your score. You won't know exactly which ones you got wrong. Uh, each quiz classically has eight questions on it. And then you'll be able to have access to those questions, not necessarily the answers. You can review them and then come back and take another instance of the pre-quiz. Uh, the score that you receive will be the maximum of those two attempts. And um, again, eventually I'll, I'll release, release the, the question answers on those. Um, the thing to worry about though is, is that between the two items, there may be some differences in the order of the multiple choice answers and also some of the parameters used in the calculations may change. So for example, um, one question may ask you to say calculate the payment on a loan at 6%. The next time you see it, you may see calculate the payments on a loan at 8% or something along those lines. Also associated with each module will be a post quiz. Um, these count twice the pre quizzes. You only get to take them once. Post quizzes will also contain some questions from previous modules. So it requires you to make sure that you've got kind of a constant review going through. So I wanted to warn you about that ahead of time. They will also have more long response questions. And so instead of just saying, well, what's the number here? It may be something along the lines of 
fill in the spreadsheet or show a full amortization table. So these are gonna take a, a little bit longer than the pre-quizzes, so please plan appropriately. All the quizzes have a 120 minute limit that's there, strictly enforced. Uh, D2L sh should cut you off by the time that one hits. Um, the usual amount of time that students spend on these quizzes is about 45 minutes. So if you find yourself consistently scoring low and spending 15 minutes on it, the reason is probably that you're missing something essential about the material. Uh, please do not, you know, like click up, a, open a quiz and see what's there and then close it. The timer is still running in the background. So the minute you start it, the timer starts. Uh, so please only do it when you have time to complete the quiz and actually finish them. Uh, the last sentence we have right here is another one of the things that I've, I've noticed students when I, uh, I see some similar answers. I see students also have uh, same IP address. Um, so this is one of those ones that just says, do me a favor and don't not work on these side by side with your roommate. I find it rather irritating. Uh, all the deadlines for all the quizzers are shown on D2L. Uh, and all of the quizzes should be up by the time the course opens on Monday. So you know every single deadline for every single quiz um, in this class. Nothing should be a surprise. So modify the rest of your schedule appropriately, schedule time to do these things appropriately. Uh, also, um, this may intersect itself with some disruptions in T2L or some planned downtime. Um, you take care of that kind of thing in your schedule. Uh, just because there's downtime in D2L like an hour before they're due doesn't mean that I'm going to change the deadline or something along those lines. Um, it's just that's when it is supposed to be due, so please plan appropriately. Um, I'll use Piazza for um, any kind of news announcements or anything like that. Um, and the idea is it's independent of D2L and the PSU login mechanism, which means I can still uh, communicate with you when all the school stuff is down. It's the reason why we have it that way as well as the easy markup on it. Uh, and again, it just says, hey, look, if you got a question about the function of the class, go to Piazza and check it out in the logistics folder. Now, onto the wiki. Um, the wiki is huge at this point. Uh, seems to go on forever. It has lots of videos. I mean, there's hundreds of them hiding around. They're all short little things. Um, watch every single one of those in the module that you're supposed to. Uh, they are pretty good, but you're going to get sick and tired of my droning ass voice. I'm sorry about that. Um, the, uh, you can find a link to the wiki on the D2L landing page, but bookmark it on, on your own and um, uh, make it a little bit easier to get to. Um, it takes a couple of steps to get into the wiki. Uh, the first thing you need to do is go to wiki. Get yourself a wiki dot account. That's step one. Then go to the wiki that I've created itself. That's the EC three hundred and four PDX EDU one, and you have to ask to be a member there. And so it's a quick little process where you you know you, you tell me what your username is, what your name is, and you know say hey look I'm part of your course. And basically I wake up every single morning and let everyone who asked into the wiki. That's all it is. So there could be up to a 24 hour delay on you signing up and getting access to the wiki itself. So again, don't try to get access to the wiki in the 20 minutes before a quiz is due. It's just not going to work. Um, again, it's generally speaking, I wake up in the morning and let everyone into the wiki who's done it. So count on a 24 hour delay. Uh, the reason why I do this is that the wiki is a wiki. You're allowed to edit it. And making sure that you have a membership and access means it's really easy for you to go in, click the little tab on the bottom to edit the wiki, fix the thing that's annoying you. Oftentimes it's grammar and spelling kind of errors uh, or a formatting thing. Hit save and it's fixed for everyone. Uh, the wiki itself started out just as an outline as I'd created and I inserted all of the um, uh, videos and podcasts, students tended to fill in the text and get to the uh, additional links that is there. Uh, also a note about the wiki is that I've got no control over it. I'm a customer on it, so you can't ask me to fix things if you can't log in or anything like that. Deal with wiki dot on that end. 
Um, so that's another one that I'm kind of not responsible for you. Uh, oh, and do me a favor, if you're gonna edit, practice first before you do it, if you're not familiar with uh, the MediaWiki uh, markup language. Next item, netiquette. Because um, we're all online, things get to happen with a delay. Uh, and if we're in a normal classroom and someone's being um, a rude SOB, I can usually handle it right away and lock it down. But in an online environment, I can't see it right away. And it sometimes can go on for hours, perhaps even a day before I'm supposed to see what's going on. That means that you have to be um, a little bit more uh, nicer and more careful than you are in an in-person environment. Um, so if I see some things which are against the general rules and in civil, I'll go ahead and slam down on you there. Um, if it continues to be a problem, I'll just block you from the resource. Uh, that means things like not having access to the forum, which can really harm you in an online course. Um, this means that if you engage in basically defacement of the wiki, I can block you from the wiki, that kind of thing. Uh, so again, it's your best conduct is what we're looking for. Uh, in general, I do not have problems with that in this class. Uh, students that take this class are almost invariably extremely civil and understand proper conduct in a class and learning environment. Grading. Um, there's two things to worry about in the grades. Uh, that's the online assignments, which are 75% of the grade, and your final exam, which is 25% of the grade. There is no explicit breakdown where it says that, you know, 90% above is uh, an A, 80% to 90% is a B or anything like that. Uh, that's actually just silly from a statistical decision-making uh, point of view. I don't have, you know, strong tests on, you know, what is the probability that a student will be able to um, answer correctly this, this kind of test. So it doesn't make any sense to do it. And in fact, what I hope to get is a, um, a uniform distribution of scores, the weighted average scores that are there, over as wide a range as possible. So I try to maximize the entropy of the scores. I then scan through the scores and I look for uh, gaps in the distribution. That's where I draw the lines on the grades. Um, in my uh, in-person and hybrid courses, I typically get about 30% A's, 30% B's. Uh, but in the previous times I've done the online version of the class, I have given many more F's than I usually do. And primarily it's because of a large number of students putting off assignments at the last minute. In previous versions of the class, I basically had almost everything do, um, you know, the, the, I, I basically had the first quarter of the class done by halfway through. I had another thing where, you know, 75% had to be done by 75% through, and there were just way too many students attempting to do three weeks of work in an hour and a half, and it just wasn't working out. I've spaced the deadlines out every single week, and hopefully this will result in an improvement in those grades and less procrastination damage to people's GPAs. Uh, online quizzes, the big ones we want to go through here. Uh, again, there, there are two types that count for a grade, pre and post. Uh, as far as your grade goes, uh, a pre-quiz with 20 points is worth the same as one with three. And so it's the percentage that matters, not the sum of the points across all the quizzes. Uh, the upshot is, is that points between quizzes are not comparable. Um, what you should do as your study pattern is just first read the material. And that means listen to everything that's there in the wiki. Do that first. I know it's a slightly different pattern than what you're used to doing in some of your other courses, um, this pattern of reading everything ahead of time, um, but that is a some of the social sciences and humanities program to make sure that you do it ahead of time and then come to uh, take the material. Uh, oftentimes engineers find themselves using the course material, so whether it's a wiki or a book, as a reference after they start the quizzes or homework. I need you to read it first or else you will not succeed. Primarily it's because this material is outside of your normal course of study, so you can't use the same pattern there. You don't have enough uh, background knowledge to make it work. After you read the material, try some of the practice quiz questions. Work your way through them until you're a little bit more comfortable. Take a break. 
once you're done taking a break, do a quick review, do some more of the practice questions and kind of build yourself up to it. Once you get confident, take one of the pre-quizzes and in between, you've got the pre-quiz and you've got plenty of time. You know exactly what every single question is. You can sit down with that piece of paper. You can review everything in the wiki and try to sort out what the answer is to each one of the questions. I had a previous student who said that it is simply academically irresponsible to get anything other than a perfect score on the pre-quizzes because, hey, you've already got the questions ahead of time. Why shouldn't you get the questions right? Uh, she was off by one question over the course of a term. So if you take the time in between, they, you can, generally speaking, get a perfect score on the pre-quizzes. Um, you will also, um, uh, should wait a day and then take the post quiz. Each of the pre quizzes and post quizzes uh, has a deadline. Um, the deadlines are generally um, Sunday, Monday, and I believe Friday, and each time at 5 p.m. Um, don't think of the 5 p.m. as a barrier. I just didn't want to make it so that um, uh, students who procrastinate are going to be doing things at 11.59 at night, uh, flooding the forums with you know, all sorts of questions that no one who's taking them at that time can actually answer, uh, as well as grousing. Uh, at least at that time of the day, they can instant message me and I can go like, no, you're way off, uh, and explain those kinds of things. Uh, and so again, last thing to take post quiz. The um, quiz score is equal to the sum of the correct, uh, correct percent correct on the pre-quizzes. Remember, it's the, the, that, that number is the highest of the, uh, the two attempts that you have there, plus twice the sum of the percent correct on the post-quizzes. And um, I've got a little adjustment that's here where I will drop either the uh, two lowest pre-quizzes or the lowest post-quiz, whichever results in a higher score. And this thing is there to make it so that I don't have to evaluate uh, any of the reasons that you had to miss those kinds of things. So it's there for technical failure. There was a power outage while you were taking the quizzes. Uh, you simply forgot illness, brain fart, anything like that is there and that takes care of it. In general, it doesn't change anyone's grade, but it makes everyone feel a lot better when it happens. I take care of that adjustment at the end of the term. You don't have to do anything about it. You don't have to tell me which one it is. I do it. Now on to the final exam, and this is a new component for this course. <coughs> there is an in-person final exam. You have to be on campus for this one. It is 25% of your grade. It is composed of questions that you have already seen on D2L. Um, the primary function I have of the D2L is to give me some assurance that the person who is doing all the online work is the person who's enrolled in the course. So when you show up for the final exam, you show up with picture ID so I can see that too. Now, I fully encourage you to get perfect scores and high scores on the final exam. But what I'm looking for is if anyone who shows up the final exam and starts getting really, really, really low scores when they've already been giving me high scores on the uh, online work. And what that ends up being is a signal that I should investigate those low scores and go ahead and turn folks in. Um, this has in particular become a problem at PSU um, in what was it, spring term, eight students in my class were eventually suspended for uh, cheating on either the in-class or in-person quizzes. Uh, and this has gone through the student life process, uh, had uh, Dominic, you know, talk to them and it was determined that they didn't do something which was appropriate, uh, including one student who just flat out told me or asked me to reopen a quiz because the person he was having um, do the quiz uh, for him uh, closed it without completing it. So he just told me flat out that he was cheating. Uh, and again, the idea is if we can see implausibly low scores on the final exam, that's the kind of thing that uh, sends things over to uh, student life for a student code of conduct violation. Here's the fun little trick though. Because uh, taking the final exam is required for passing a uh, grade in the course, that means that if there is a student code of conduct violation, contrary to a lot of other classes, you will receive an F in the course. And I hope that is understood. 
other rules that we have there, do me a favor, don't beg for a grade. Um, it's, I, it's not that I'm cold hearted or anything like that. It's just that I've been lied to far too many times. Your academic performance is what determines your grade, not anything else, not how much I like you or anything like that. I go by the rank in the class. Uh, when you're completing your online quizzes, go ahead and use your book, use your wiki, use calculator, spreadsheets, notes, anything that you want to, as long as it is not another student or person. So you're the one who's intended to do these things, but you're expected to have the world open to you beyond another, uh, except for another agent. Uh, meet me with off, uh, office hours early on in the process. Um, so I know that I've, you know, I've, I've seen uh, comments online and I keep a scan up for these things that said, yeah, he would, you know, only meet with me for 30 minutes and that's not enough time because I had questions on eight weeks of stuff. It's like, no, if you've got a problem, get to me, um, set up a meeting so that we can talk about your specific problem. So go early. Uh, one of the worst things about teaching is uh, being there in week nine, having a student show up uh, and they've had problems with something that took place in week two, which you're expected to know for everything after week two and to discover that they know that they don't understand anything that happened after that. And at that point, I will continue to help. I, I'm, you know, I'm kind of morally obligated to do that, but I feel like I'm giving CPR to a corpse. Uh, there's almost nothing can be done. There's nothing can be done to, to the grade at, at, at that point. So again, office hours early, ask questions early, don't put it off. Um, this right here is um, the diversity statement, which is part of the part where we learn to be polite to each other, uh, even in an online environment. Uh, this is the uh, statement about the uh, Disabilities Resource Center. So if you are like me, have some kind of uh, physical or learning disability, um, a letter or email will end up showing up to me. I don't think it'll have any effect on the online components, but there's probably something that needs to be arranged for the in-class final exam. Another statement about academic honesty, which basically says don't cheat. Um, this is the statement that says right here, the sympathetic to family emergencies, is that invariably something serious will happen to a student in the class over the course of the term. Uh, sometimes it's they will be hospitalized. Sometimes they need to make, say, an emergency trip uh, because a family member died. Um, all of these things are possible. Make sure that if you have an emergency like that that is going to hamper your ability to complete this course, that you talk to me when it happens, not weeks after the fact. So again, it's when it happens, we can decide, plan for managing the difficulty that you have, the plan will be in writing and I'll know what's going on immediately. So again, don't tell me that you had to leave to uh, go to a funeral outside the country, you know, for two weeks uh, at the end of the term. Tell me saying, look, I've had this problem with my grandfather died. I have to go to the funeral. Tell me about it so we can take care of the problems that are there. All right. Uh, quizzes, again, emphasis is supposed to be... Um, taken by you. Um, I, again, sent uh, or actually set a personal record with sending people to Dominic. Um, he sorted out a couple of them, which were kind of innocent bystanders and somebody else is cheating. That's why it's only eight and not a larger number. And then um, if you've not already done so, there's a safe campus module in detail that you're supposed to complete. There'll be a uh, another video um, about D2L and those online tools. There'll be a full outline of the course that's up there, uh, both on D2L and in the wiki. Uh, so again, if you've got any questions, please go ahead and post them on uh, the Piazza forum and I'll answer them as quickly as I can. Thank you.